everyone, it's Sleepy Reader, Damien here with a um, another comic book countdown, comic book thoughts. I am more than a week late on this though, so these are these go back to the two two weeks ago, basically. Um, I just I read them all quite a while ago, and then attempted a video and, and didn't end up going with it. But one thing I did with with this set of 14 comics is that a lot of them, maybe about 10 of them, I timed how long they took me to read. Someone mentioned in some comments of one of my videos recently that comics take him or her uh, five minutes to read. So, and I've done, <clears throat> excuse me, did this a long time ago. Um, and I remember being surprised at how quickly some of the comics took me to read. Um, does it mean that the comic books are really well done so they read quickly? Or does it mean they're lacking in content? Or the ones that take a really long time, are they long and boring and you have to sludge through them? Or are, are they just filled with so much more good content that they take longer? And I think that varies <laughs> case by case, to tell the truth. But anyway, I just thought it was an interesting little way of... I'm obsessive over details sometimes. Um, so, but I will do these in a reverse countdown, starting with number 14 and give you a few thoughts about each. Wonder Twins slips back to the last place. I have finally taken it off of my pull list. Uh, it just wasn't funny again. Uh, I don't know what else to say. And I did not like the, the art too much and I really disliked the way it was colored. So when you add it all up, one good issue out of four for me, uh, not enough. Um, and did I write, did I see, how long did that, yeah, Wonder Twins took me 15 minutes to read, so 15 minutes and 8 seconds, I'm a little surprised by that, um, was that because I was bored and slowed down, I'm not sure, at number 13 is Conan the Barbarian, and I'm finally getting to the point where, I mean, you all heard how much I hated the first issue, and then I was liking it a bit more, but I'm finally at the point where I'm saying, is it worth it to stick with this throughout the entire, quote, arc of the story, however long it's going to be, the death of Conan, all these different events in his life leading up to these characters on the on the cover, much better, much better portrayed on the cover than inside, uh, finally killing him and spilling his blood for their dark god who uh, wants the blood of someone who's escaped death so many times. This, this issue just really struck me as this is not a story. This is just a few different ideas about Conan and the time he might have been in the army of, uh, is it called Turan? No, I can't remember. In this one, they're fighting sticks. Um, yeah, Turan. He's in the army of, he's a mercenary in the army of Turan. They're fighting the STYX, the country sticks. They're not doing so well. They have a little empire going. Are they also the Harkanians? I'm a bit, I can't remember that. I can see why other people like this art, but for some reason it, it just doesn't work that well for me. And no matter what the the colorist Matt Wilson tries to do, it just doesn't, I kind of like that page, but for overall, it just doesn't capture something for me. So it wasn't quite a story. The art didn't quite grip me. I. I don't know though. I I feel like I, I I've gone six issues down this road. I want I kind of want to see what they're gonna do when they finally try to sacrifice old Conan to this dark god. Is he really gonna die? Uh, that's about the only thing that's got me hooked here. So I can't quite decide whether to drop it from my pull list. I got a weird new chair that's rolling around. I bought it at IKEA. Um, okay, and in at number three, I don't think I did time. Let's see, did I time how long Conan took me to read? Let's see. Uh, no, Conan is not on my... Oh, you know, on Conan, I got I got bored with it, and I, I st had started timing it, but then I stopped reading it, so the, there was no um, ultimate time of how long it took me to read the whole thing when I came back to it. And then there is Excellence, which comes in at number 12. I'm a little sad. A, n a number one from Image that didn't really grab me. Um, this cover's kind of cool, and it's a super thick issue, great value for your money. Um, 
and there's a lot of intriguing it's a little bit jonathan hickman ish and it's layout with bits of information about the world that you're supposed to put together but um ultimately the the art style didn't work for me too much it felt kind of like animation translated into into comics which i don't always like although it seemed very well done but just some, somehow didn't grab me but even more the um the story just We've got these these people who are, I guess, some kind of magical guardians, um, and they they go through training and and they are given tests. It, and our hero is very late to his powers, um, but that's all that matters to his father. So there's kind of a father son thing going on, and but ultimately, yeah, I didn't. I couldn't uh, I couldn't care about what was going on. I was kind of curious and I'm still kind of curious, but it it seems almost like they're like magical guardian angels to regular people and all this magic and action they're doing in in the big example we're given here is all about I guess they're invisible to regular people and it's all about uh, helping this guy propose to his fiance or, or propose to his girlfriend. And an important deciding moment in his life is the big test. And it's weird because all the characters are African-American except the guy they're helping out propose to his girlfriend. Was this, is this just a, uh, I appreciate putting lots of African-Americans in as, as main characters, but is this a mistake or, I mean, not a mistake, but just a coincidence? Or is the point here that uh, black magicians are guardian angels to the lives of white yuppies to make sure they go okay. <laughs> um, I don't know if that was at all the intention here. Um, so anyway, I, it, it's another one of those things that could, I, I'm, I'm mildly curious about it. I could end up picking up more issues or maybe not. So it came in at number 12. At number 11, was Supergirl. It, I, I love this um, old school kind of cover. And they brought back the artist, uh, is it Kevin McGuire? Is that his name? Yeah, I think it's Kevin McGuire. And, and it was a fun action kind of issue. I think it read quite quickly. Let me see if I timed this one. Um, yeah, Supergirl took me six minutes and eight seconds to read because it was all a big fight scene, but I thought it was it was done well. I'm curious to see how the crossover with Superman goes. I guess I will buy the one Superman issue that that crosses over with th this possibly, or maybe I can just keep reading Supergirl. And there there's a bunch of elements in this story that I wonder how they'll work out. Um, and I don't know if uh, Mark Andreco and whichever artist he ends up working with will explore them as much as I would like, including the relationship with this uh, Kuluian uh, ar archaeologist who, who was raised by the evil alien crystal woman. Um, there's a great picture. And um, the, the axe that she's been using, the, the axe of Rogel Czar, which seems to be you know, one of those weapons that affects you and controls you to some extent. I, I hope that gets explored further. So we'll see. But that was obviously a very short read. I also, I'd say everything but Wonder Twins I enjoyed at some level. Conan, I was a little dicey on. Excellence just, yeah, it was good, but it, it wasn't bad at all. But it just sort of didn't hook me as much as it, as you want a number one issue to do. Um, so Symbiote Spider-Man came in at number 10 and this was a fun issue. Um, I guess the only reason it came in at number 10 is everything else. I liked everything else afterwards, but it was good. Um, I feel like uh, Peter David's doing a good job and, and I'm enjoying this much more than I have Greg Land work, artwork in the past. Maybe because a lot of it is the superhero action, which he seems to be doing pretty well. As I said with issue number one, it doesn't seem like the perfect art to go with um, with uh, Peter David's Peter David's humorous kind of take on on superhero stories, 
but um, but it worked out okay in this issue actually better than in the last issue so and let me see did I time that one um, yes this one took me eight minutes and four seconds so two more minutes it took me two more minutes than Supergirl to read we've got Hawkman um, which I usually I try to get the A covers they forgot to put this in my pull list and this is all I found but it's actually a beautiful painting and everything but I like I like to be consistent and have all the A covers and I like having the logo at the top and everything I don't know who this covers by but um, it probably says inside so um, Hawkman has been consistently a fun cool action comic to read the uh, cover artist is Julian Totino Tedesco Tedesco hmm. anyway uh, still you know loving the art and a fun story uh, Brian Hitch art of course um, I think finally we'll get a new arc with next issue I think this arc went on a little long it's a bit I guess it's 12 issues so they can fit it in two trades <laughs> um, it really would have been fine at about seven issues <laughs> six or seven issues or eight issues um how long did hawkman take me i think i did time this one no i did not because i picked this one up actually later on uh so i i think it would have if if they had condensed the story a little more if i if it hasn't at this point felt dragged out a little too long it would have ranked even higher than number nine but since all of these are kind of good comics um the rankings the, the 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 fractional differences between like uh, symbiote spider-man to hawkman to detective comics to the one that follows it detective comics comes in at number eight did i i did time this this one took me 11 minutes and 21 seconds now in my timing i include whatever i do the amount of time i spend looking at the cover if i read a letters page or something like that this did not have a letters page i had all already read the preview in the back for this um, Batman last night on Earth, um, which I will be getting. I'm kind of curious about it. This real Brad Walker. I said this last time. Brad Walker's art is a standout and um, really makes me enjoy this a lot. I'm a little leery just because uh, Tomasi really flubbed the last arc he did. Um, and I'm not, you know, it, it feels like yet another story about what does it mean to be Batman and deconstructing Batman a little bit. However, it's it's done well, it's fun, it's got amazing, amazing art. I think part of part of the thing I like about the art is it evokes a bit of an old school feeling along it's modern and old at the same time, and I really appreciate that. Lots it's very inky, lots of blacks. Um, really well colored too. Let me see who's the colorist. We got so the the Penciler is Brad Walker. The inker is Andre Hennessy. That's real old school to have a penciler and an inker. And Nathan Fairborn is the colorist. He's a very uh, rock solid colorist. Um, so uh, all all elements clicking here to to bring the uh, decent script by Tomasi to uh, scintillating life. So that was number eight. Number seven, Shazam. Another one that could be even higher, except I'm now realizing each issue we're, we're now getting a, a little portion of the braided threads of the plot. So in other words, it's being written for the trade almost exclusively. Um, so I'm and and when you add in the fact that it's it's a little slow to come out, so you start losing the excitement of it. Um, I'm going to keep getting it in individual issues, but um, but I do I do wish it had more of a individual issue shape to it. But I think it's going to be a particularly great read in trades. Hopefully Jeff Johns and the various artists who've been on it, Eagle Sham in particular, but there's been some other really good artists on it, continue to stick with it to tell the full story. Yeah, I could almost, if it came out in a nice hardback, I could almost see uh retiring my single issues and trying and getting a single volume you know uh especially with deluxe oversize or something because i'm really enjoying it 
So like I said, it would be ranked higher if it were for that feeling of it not being an individual issue kind of thing. And did I time this one? Apparently I did not. Coming in at number, so Shazam was number seven. This is number six, section zero. In a way, Shazam is better than it, but section zero gives you more as an individual reader. Uh, it, it's very close between, say, Shazam and section zero and uh, and detective for that matter. The, the, the last three or four are all almost identical, uh, but they're not identical. And I, I do love the old school feeling of section zero. I guess I'm just repeating myself from issue one. It feels like you get a lot of story here. I think you get a lot of pages too. It may be uh, 28, 30 pages. I'm not sure. I forgot if I counted the number of pages, I've forgotten. Um, and I did time this one. I know that uh, 18 minutes and 43 seconds it took me to read this. I love that cover, by the way. But I, I now, from what some people have told me, this may be uh, part of the, did they do two or three issues back in the 90s, actually? And then they completed it through Kickstarter. So maybe issues one through three will be the, um, now I'm looking at it, does, does, will be the, the, the old ones, and then we'll get newer material, starting with the later issues of the arc. Um, We'll see. I'm, I'm not sure if that information is correct. Um, but if we notice a sudden change with issue four, that would be interesting. So yeah, this is a really nice package. Old school storytelling. It evokes the, the John Byrne, George Perez kind of eras. And, and with some Jack Kirby in it. I've, that's the other thing I, I noticed while reading this, that it felt like every three or four pages they added in a new crazy element. And that felt kind of like Jack Kirby at his best, where he just keeps shooting out ideas at you. Not that their ideas are often as big and amazing as Jack Kirby, but still a lot of really fun stuff and different creatures and events. A lot happens here. It could be even higher if I cared even more about the characters, but the characters are fun, are fine. Um, so in at number five is Savage Sword of Conan, my much preferred Conan comic with great art by um, Ron Garney and very good writing by Jerry Duggan and particularly just a good sense of who Conan is, um, which I really appreciated. This is the finale and it just it kind of wraps up and you have your big fight with the wizard and everything like that. So uh it as an individual issue it didn't rock my socks as much as um as the earlier ones that were you know the the journey is more fun than getting there in a way but it was a perfectly fine uh conclusion and ends the way you want a conan story adventure to end um and i really really hope this team gets reunited Oh man, they've got such good Conan going. Why not do more of it? Um, but in the next issue, we're getting Meredith Finch. I think she's just doing one or two issues. And then we're getting a Jim Zub story with Patrick Zercher, who's an interesting artist. I'll be curious to see what he does with Conan. So I'll just, I'm letting Savage Sword of Conan ride since it's always going to be different creative teams. That's definitely of interest to me. And I think I timed how long that took. It did not take very long, if I remember. It took six minutes and 55 seconds. So of all the ones I timed, the shortest one was Supergirl, and that would be the second shortest read. Now, um, I definitely, you know, even though it was a short read, I keep coming back to it and looking at it. I think I was looking at it before I read it, too, and just savoring the artwork and everything. This is definitely, to me, an example of one that's done really well, and that's part of why it reads fast. You. You absorb it and you're deep into the story and you have to turn the pages, etc. But of course, there isn't as much story per page as in something like Section Zero, um, which took 10 more minutes, was more than twice as long of a read. Okay, then um, Black Hammer did not take me too long to read, longer than the Conan and the Supergirl. It took me eight minutes and 16 seconds. Black Hammer, Age of Doom, 
This is still getting better. For a while, Black Hammer was like one of my number one, number two comics anytime it came along. But it's still lower on my list just because there's still a feeling of they stretch the story out too much. But this was a really good issue. Love the art. The story was good. Um, did I give it a ranking? Did I mention it is number four? Every, any of the top five here, were, they were, again, a really closely linked group of comics. Um, again, it's, it's as much the art as the writing, if not more. The Dean Ormston art really kicks up this kind of story up to the high, high level that it needs to be and brings just the right mood. Uh, and, and, the, and the colorist, of course, Dave Stewart, who we always are in danger of taking for granted. Um, and then we've got Bronze Age Boogie, which I also think, yeah, this one took me a long time to read, not just because of the main story, but because of everything in the package. The whole thing I spent um, 20 minutes and 43 seconds on. So this, this was my longest read of all. Uh, with Section Zero coming out behind it. Part of that is because I did read the um, the one-page story at the beginning that pretends to be the first chapter of a story, but is not, you realize, by the twist ending at the end. The twist itself was kind of dumb, but I still enjoyed reading the story. There was a backup story about this um, uplifted bear who becomes a cosmonaut. Or, or because of cosmic rays, um, gained power. And um, great art, great. And then because I'm really into the Ahoy comics, I've been finding that their, um, that their text page, just talking about the issue and about other things going on at Ahoy, is very interesting. Now, they may be joking, or they may have finally revealed that Ahoy is an anagram that stands for, where did it go? It's really stupid. Um, or no, maybe it was in a different issue that I read. Something about assholes. <laughs> oh, well, I can't find it. Anyway, I read the text thoroughly, but even, even there, and, and then in, in the story itself, in the Bronze Age Boogie story, there was a text page, which I did read. Sometimes I'll skip something like that. I, I hate seeing that kind of, I don't know, that kind of typesetting in a in a comic with small print and with the the mar the margins so wide and everything like that. It's not very readable, but I read it and it was worth reading. Um, but anyway, loving the story, our Bronze Age heroine has now come into the '70s, which is the Bronze Age of the comic books, and is having adventures with lots of Bronze Age comic book and Bronze Age movie. You might say 70s movie type characters, a wonderful black exploitation heroine, a um, a decent but maybe less exciting uh, kung fu character, very much in the Bruce Lee and the Shang Chi and uh, Iron Fist mode, um, and also we have the invading Martians who are very much in my mind linked to the Martians in the Kill Raven stories in Marvel's wild and bizarre 1970s War of the Worlds, which then changed its title to Kill Raven, about the Martians coming back after they recover from the common cold and enslaving all of humanity and <clears throat> having the best fighters fight e human fighters fight each other uh, in in gladiator gladiatorial matches to to uh, to amuse the Martians. And we get all that in here. So I, the amount of uh, different uh, angles on this idea of the Bronze Age boogie that they pack into each issue is really marvelous. As you can see, the art and color is very good. This, this scene also evoked a scene in Commandy to me, actually, now that, I, now that I look at it again. And this is definitely, again, a comic that I will come back to. I'm really enjoying looking through it. Um, and yeah, so Ahoy strikes again, very good. The one Ahoy comic I don't like, I picked up um, Hashtag Danger, I believe it's called, and I didn't finish it. Um, maybe I'll come back to it and try it again, but something about it I don't like. 
despite the artwork by Chris Giarusso that I do like. Coming in at number two is Curse Words. Curse Words is ramping up to a peak, I think. And this issue was a really fun and riveting read, if you've been reading all along. There's, there's just a lot you can get out of it. Um, love, love, learning to love the artwork and the coloring more and more, the, the wild layouts. Um, just a lot of plot stuff is ramping up to pay off, and I'm getting really excited to see more. Um, I don't know how much to show you in case you're in the middle of reading it. And, and so I'm not showing you the most exciting pages, actually. Uh, but I, I really enjoyed this. I think I timed this one, too. Curse Words only took me eight minutes and 18 seconds to read. Um, <clears throat> Curse Words feels like one that I will want to go back and read the entire series when they wrap it up. And I think they have announced how many more issues there are. It's issue 21. I think they've said 30 issues. I'm not positive on that one. And finally, at number one, actually deserving to be number one over all the rest. So the five through five through two were all very, very close. But I think right away I knew uh, Ice Cream Man would be my number one. Uh, once again, you know, they respect their readers in the sense they assume you're intelligent and daring enough as a reader to deal with all the... Uh, jumps and strangeness and disconnections that they make. I even love this cover. I mean, I guess it's kind of obvious, but there's an ice cream cone there on the cover. Um, they never explain anything. Um, but this one had a kind of Aliens 2001 slash um, one of those other sci-fi movies. Well, Sunshine, but there's another one I'm thinking of, but kind of a a spaceship horror kind of story. Um, I love the art, love the coloring. Luckily, they had none of their... Uh, occasionally, I don't like the lettering in here, but there was not a problem with that. I don't love the lettering in here. I loved these uh, scenes with the blackness of space. Somehow, that was really powerful. Uh, <clears throat> I don't want to give away too much. I do have theories for those who are currently reading it. So um, I'll, I'll hold this up, and when I put it down, I'm done spoiling it. So if, if you haven't read Ice Cream Man yet, skip ahead. Uh, so my theory here, for those of you who've read it, is that this is actually a flashback to another universe, not our Earth or the Earth that most of the issues of Ice Cream Man has taken place in. But this is our main weird, creepy, immortal characters travel it, it's showing us how they got a whole bunch of s information about an earth and are traveling through to the next dimension whoops i just knocked my microphone down traveling through to the next dimension where they are going to recreate earth perhaps that's our earth with all the information in this arc um so yeah that's my theory uh, i could be totally wrong so I, I feel like this is the second issue we've had that takes place in a different, or that I'm sure takes place in a different dimension than our own, or than the one of our own story. Okay, so that's that. I'm going to show you, um, <clears throat> well, let me know about how long you think it should take to read a comic book, how much information should be in there. You know, cost-wise, it seems like surely a, a comic book should take us at, have a good at least half hours worth of entertainment given the high cost of comics these days, if not more. I mean, if you compare it to going to a movie, uh, well, it depends on where you are and, and what kind of theaters are around you. What, what does a movie cost now? Maybe $12 around here, I think. I don't go out to movies very often. Um, on the other hand, if you don't like the cost of comics, you can get uh, Comixology Unlimited, Marvel Unlimited, and DC Unlimited, or DC Universe, um, which is an unlimited, they just added a bazillion uh, DC Comics into that app. My daughter and I have been reading like crazy through their super Supergirls. But anyway, um, you could do the Netflix version of comics now if you want to read comics, and you don't mind reading digitally. Or you can just buy comics out of 50 cent and dollar bins if you don't. So those are like 
versus going to the movie theater or going or viewing at home, owning the DVD versus uh, getting some all you can eat streaming service. <clears throat> so, yeah, it's a it, it's it, when you pay four dollars and it takes you eight minutes to read it. That does seem like maybe a bad economic choice. But to me, it doesn't um, just because I want what I want. Anyway, here's the comics uh, that I picked up this past Wednesday, but have not read. Actually, one of them I've read. Oh, and actually on the top of my little stack here, I have comics that I picked up with that group, but I never got around to reading. Oberon, I got actually stuck inside another comic and I didn't read it. I'm not too excited about Oberon at this point, but I will try to read it. And then I'm really excited about Gunning for the Hits, but I was an issue behind. This takes a nice long time to read. And I was reading it and something distracted me. I was reading issue four, so I haven't quite finished issue four and I need to get to issue five. I really, really like Gunning for the Hits, or Gunning for Hits, but I don't think it's for everybody at all. <clears throat> oh, and at my store, when I picked up comics, as I often do, I, I looked through their um, back issue bin, and I had some credit with them because they accidentally, in my last pull, gave me a $35 comic, a, a variant cover for $35. And they took it back, and they could have given me cash, but I, I took credit. And so I picked up um, from Beyond the Unknown, Supersized. Mo almost all of these in here, it turns out, are reprints. But there is a new story. They even advertise the creators on the cover by Denny O'Neill and Murphy Anderson. And I, I really enjoy these kinds of things. I wonder if they're originally from Strange Adventures or from something else. Because that was number um, eight. Oh, and here's number seven which also only has one new story, although it does not list the creators of that new story. Um, but I, I thought it was really fun to get a hold of these. And then trickling in a few more Submariners for that Submariner run I'm chasing after. Um, these both, both of these Submariners have uh, Marie Severin artwork in them and Roy Thomas scripts. So the, both of those are really good things. I'm really looking forward to reading these. Um, so 19 and 18. I've got these things in reverse order. Sorry about that. 18 is the classic reader's copy. I don't know if you can see it. Uh, someone was asking me what a reader's copy meant. And um, and I've been on YouTube long enough to hear so many people say reader's copy. I know what that means. And I think I kind of guessed the first time I heard it. But it means a copy that's all beat up. So you, if you're reading it, you don't have to worry about taking good care of it. Because everything I buy is actually a reader's copy in the sense that I'm going to read it. I don't buy things to not read them. I don't buy slabs. And um, yeah. So, but anyway, so I, I kind of wish this one was in better shape, but I just grabbed it while I was there. And if I ever think of it, I might and see a ni nicer copy, I might get it. Because again, nice Marie Severin. I don't know if she's doing the cover, maybe. You know, sometimes I confuse Marie Severin and Herb Trimp. At times, they actually do look similar. Trimpy, sorry. So the new comics I bought on Wednesday include All Time Comics. This is the one I have read. I can't quite decide what I think about it. I love this cover. They have covers by Das Pastoris. And I want more Das Pastoris. I think he also has done some interior comics here and there. I assume they're not as intensely painted as this. Did he do an issue of Thor, in fact, with early on in Jason Aaron? I'm not sure. On the inside, this was like a lot like an underground comic. It was very weird and hard to understand, and I guess was making fun of superheroes. Um, it's supposed to be both a, a profane and a love letter to the Bronze Age. It's the general idea of all-time comics. And I guess this is issue zero. So it was drawn by these underground cartoonists. But the next issue is supposedly going to be done by an old friend to old time comic book, comic book uh, buyers. Trevor Von Eden is coming. What does Trevor Von Eden draw like now? I don't know. It's been a while. I didn't even know he's still drawing comics. But I used to be a big fan of Trevor Von Eden. Skyward. One of the co-creators of Black Lightning, by the way. Skyward, really excited to be reading more of this. 
Um, Guardians of the Galaxy. I haven't been that excited about this series. I was hoping to be, but I, don't, I saw someone giving a good review to this issue, so maybe it'll pick up for me. Lucifer, super excited that I'll be reading another issue of Lucifer. A great cover there. Um, Oblivion, I consistently enjoy Oblivion. This is actually one of their least appealing covers, but um, Sabrina, number two. I really enjoyed Sabrina, number one, especially the writing by Kelly Thompson, but also the art. So I assume it'll still be the same team, and I'm looking forward to seeing what, what goes on there. I have jumped on the Immortal Hulk bandwagon. I'm a little confused how to approach this because I've read now the first six issues on the uh, Marvel Unlimited app, and I have a few scattered other issues that I've managed to pick up, but it's very hard to get back issues of the Immortal Hulk. They're not just laying around to be plucked like many most other comics are. I'm super excited for the, I believe this is number six, so the final, the final issue of season four of Kaiju Max, which um, has been a good season. So I'm um, super psyched for that. Then I got Spider-Man Life Story number three, but I haven't read number two yet. So I've got some reading there. And I picked up Fair Lady number one. I haven't read it yet, but I, uh, I like the looks of it. It's very thick for $3.99. Looks like a very good bargain financially and probably a lot of times will t take to read it. And they brag a complete story in one issue. So that that's really great. And speak of the thickest issue I've gotten in a long time, especially for $3.99, is Little Bird. And I've already spent probably 10 or 20 minutes just flipping through it and just enjoying this artwork, which evokes stuff like Mobius and um, uh, <laughs> Frank Quietly and other kinds of European artists. It just... The art is is stunning. I haven't, I haven't uh, loved. I I've enjoyed the writing, but I haven't loved it. But the art alone, it could be just gobbledygook in in the in the dialogue balloons, and it would still be worth reading. And great coloring by Matt Hollingsworth. Yeah. So here's my Spider-Man life story number two that remains to be read. Oh, and I don't. How did I get two? copies of Fair Lady. I literally don't know how that happened. So maybe I should gift this to someone. Okay, thanks for hanging on with me for, holy cow, 37 minutes. Well, so it goes. Talk to y'all later. Bye-bye.